Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 30th edition of Data Bytes, Getting Things Done with Data in Government, supported this month by Methods Analytics. I'm Gavin Freegard, Associate at the Institute for Government, and it's wonderful to welcome so many of you in person and online this evening. Let's start in the usual way. Hands up if you've been to Data Bytes before. Welcome back. Hands up if this is your first Data Bytes. Welcome. And hands up if you have confidence in Data Bytes. Some of you are getting reshuffled tomorrow. Uh, this is, of course, a momentous week as we celebrate the longevity of a great British institution that brings huge value to our nation. Yes, it's Databytes' Pearl anniversary. Forget animated bears, forget drone corgis, forget Ed Sheeran, please. Databytes has all the presentational pageantry you could ever need. Four blockbuster presentations. Or is it Netflix? I'm very confused. Let's start with the usual housekeeping. Tonight's event is on the record and we are being live streamed, obviously. For those of you on social media, it's hashtag IFG Databytes and we will be live tweeting from at IFG events. If you're here in the building, the Wi-Fi is IFG Internet Hotspot, password institute123, all lowercase. And as ever, I'll be putting your questions to our speakers. If you're watching online, use the Slido page you're almost certainly already on. If you're not, go to bit.ly slash slidodb30. If you're here at the IFG, you can, of course, raise your hand. Why does the IFG organise data bytes? Well, we aim to bring together the various different data communities in and around government. To show everyone, including those who don't think of themselves as data people, what better data can achieve in practice. And to put interesting data projects on the record so we can all learn from them. How does data bytes work? Well, you're going to see four presentations about different data projects this evening. Each presentation will last for eight minutes. Yes, just eight minutes. For those of you keen on imperial measures, that's eight minutes. There are eight bits in a byte, hence eight minutes in a data byte. The presenter will then face questions for eight minutes. Yes, just eight minutes. And then we'll move on to the next presentation. So four presentations of eight minutes, each followed by questions for eight minutes. This is our 30th IFG Data Bytes, you can watch the previous 29, including last month's Cyber and Defence Special on the IFG website. So what's happened since we last met? Well, we'll come to the vonk shortly, but first, cast your mind back just a few weeks to what remains the most shocking story of the month. Alcohol. Partying. ABBA. Yes, somehow we came second in the Eurovision Song Contest. I had a chart ready and nothing was going to stop me using it. The UK hasn't won since 1997, but as I'm sure you know, this year we finished second, doing so for a record 16th time. It comes after we finished bottom two contests in a row and after a generally challenging time for the UK in Europe, as it were. The government's had another busy month making friends and influencing people with plans to freeze the fast stream and to cut the number of civil servants. You can see those numbers were cut between 2010 and 2016 to around 380,000. Then something happened and numbers have risen every quarter since. The government's going to be furious when it finds out who is in charge. It now wants to cut around 91,000 jobs to come back down to that 2016 number, which it says will be possible thanks to using technology, a theme several Data Bytes presentations have touched on, but also because Brexit has been delivered. And if you believe that, I have a garden bridge, a bridge to Northern Ireland, an airport in the Thames estuary, and a Northern Ireland protocol to sell you. But let's take a look at the Graham Brady bunch. Yes, this week's Conservative Party vote of confidence in the Prime Minister. The PM won by 211 votes to 148, but that does mean 41% of his party voted against him. If we look at previous confidence votes and leadership challenges, and if we concentrate on those that the incumbent won, it's not a great result. Worse than May in 2018, worse than Major in 95, and actually with slightly more votes against than Thatcher suffered in 1990. This chart shows how long leaders held on after those votes. Thatcher went within days, May within months, and Major after a landslide election defeat. Not exactly auspicious. Unlike this Parliament Square bus stop, which somehow got the number of votes absolutely right. It's yet to be seen whether the 1922 committee will change their rules, allowing another challenge within a year, and having waited four years for a confidence vote, two come along at once. 
So what else might happen next? Well, the government was already making a meal of its majority. 162 Tory MPs have rebelled at some point since the 2019 election, some of them on several occasions. So the government may struggle to pass legislation without some negotiation. Interestingly, there have not been any ministerial resignations since Lord Wolfson back in April, though two parliamentary private secretaries and the PM's anti-corruption czar have all resigned recently. And there are suggestions that the government is threatening a reshuffle. Now, the grey circles are reshuffles that have affected cabinet since Thatcher. They include where a single cabinet minister has resigned and had to be replaced. Some, unsurprisingly, followed election victories. But some reshuffles are unforced, i.e. the Prime Minister just decided to reshuffle. Boris Johnson has already had four of those, a similar number in under three years to Blair and Thatcher in more like a decade. Yet another reshuffle might be the last thing the government needs as it tries to shift its focus to delivery. Now, obviously, I'm not going to finish without a few Jubilee charts. Boris Johnson is the Queen's 14th Prime Minister. She's on her 41st housing minister, a level of turnover which may go some way to explaining UK housing policy. But I'm going to end with the most important chart, which actually shows something we want more rather than less of. Forget politics, forget government effectiveness, forget, dare I say it, data. Yes, Wales have finally qualified for a second Football World Cup. <laughs> Turning to tonight, we have four excellent speakers in whom I have full confidence. Unfortunately, Sarah Dini from the UK Health Security Agency has had to pull out, but we look forward to welcoming her to a future event. So first tonight, we'll hear from Alana Keogh, data analyst at the social investment business on using data to improve grant decision making. We're very grateful to her for stepping in at such short notice. Then we'll have Richard Oakley, Director of Data Science and AI at Methods Analytics, on data science and AI in government, more accessible than you think. He'll be followed by Andrew Banks, Lead Data Scientist at the ONS Data Science Campus, on experimental analysis showing how the lowest priced everyday grocery items have changed in price. You may have seen a bit about that in the news over the last few weeks. And our final speaker tonight will be Mark Thompson, Professor in Digital Economy at the University of Exeter, on the challenges of getting the foundations right for embracing public sector innovation. Our next Data Bites will take place on Wednesday the 6th of July, a climate change special. This is normally when I say, and then we'll be taking a break for August, but no. We'll also have a bonus end of term Data Bites on Wednesday the 20th of July, which will be a justice special. A big thank you to Methods Analytics for supporting tonight's event. We are only able to keep Data Bytes going thanks to the support of our sponsors. So if you'd like to follow in Methods' virtuous footsteps, then please contact my colleague Pritesh. And if you'd like to speak or know someone who should, please get in touch with me. That's more than enough introduction with 10 seconds left. Nearly took it right, right to the edge. Um, our first speaker tonight uh, will be Alana, and she is joining us virtually. So hopefully, Alana, you can hear us. Alana, Hi. can you hear me? We can indeed. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alana, and I work as a data analyst at Social Investment Business. Uh, during this session, I'm going to talk about how we are working to incorporate data into grant decision making. So I work at Social Investment Business, which was established 20 years ago and offers loans, grants and other financial products to charities and social enterprises. It manages one of the largest social investment and grant portfolios in the UK and has provided over £500 million worth of loans and grants to hundreds of organisations. So what are the current challenges and why do we need data in grant decision making? So for funders currently, they can receive a lot of applications for grants um, during a fund. And this can take up a lot of staff time to look at and can limit the workload that an organisation can take on in order to assess all the grants fairly. It can also affect the charities and organisations applying, particularly small ones, as the application forms can be really long and time consuming for them to complete. Data can also ensure diversity in organisations being awarded grants and prevent the same organisations always receiving grants. Currently at the moment, there's an uneven power balance between grantees and funders with limited accountability. So many grantees do not know how decisions are made on who gets funding. So how can we use data to solve this? So 
before a decision making meeting, we can use it so everyone has an idea of who's applied. So we can do this through presenting it to everyone. And then before we start, we can use dashboards. So we're able to see exactly who's applied to the portfolio and then use that to maintain um, the demographics going through to the next round of um, the grants. So, for instance, if 40% of the portfolio is from London, we can ensure that 40% going through are also from London, um, if this is what the fund is after. It also um, ensures that, like, as we're doing the meeting live, we can see exactly what decisions are made. So if an organisation is selected, we can see exactly how the portfolio will look given the current selections. This ensures that we don't miss any gaps in certain types of organisations. So, for instance, if we've not funded any small organisations or particular criteria that the fund is looking to meet, and it gives everyone accountability so that then we can see exactly who we've chosen and feed this back to the organisations. We also have the additional analysis on the side of decision making. So if applications are scored, we can check that there's no unintentional bias. And after the decisions have been made, we can also look retrospectively to see if this was the expected outcome and if we've got a good range of organisations that we're funding. So this is a very brief, simple example of a dashboard. So we can have on the main page all the sort of demographics of the organisations and these can be changed live. So we can look at all the different criteria that um, organisations have um, got. And we can also then filter this. So, for instance, if uh, a funder says, OK, I like these 10 organisations, we can then say, OK, this is what these 10 organisations look like. And this is how it compares to those that have applied. And actually, you've got a gap. You've not selected anyone from this area. Um, and we can then go back in real time rather than the current process, which is retrospectively. So nothing gets put in place until further grant rounds. Um, to make the decisions um, in the moment, we can uh, have the table with all the organisations, again, this simple example, and filter by the particular criteria that the priorities of the fund. So this allows the guidance to clearly set out exactly what the priorities of the fund are and ensure that they're consistently met during the decision making process. We also make sure the organisations are anonymised so that there's no um, sort of thing where you recognise an organisation and recognise they're good, which on its own is a, is OK. But um, the problems that encounter you encounter with this is that organisations that are smaller and have historically never been funded have much more like make it's much harder for them to get a look in and receive grant funding. So this ensures that it's not ha um, having an effect. You can also see that actually if you, so if you wanted the East Midlands, you can see exactly how many people have applied. So, you know, for the next time marketing that actually you weren't attracting enough organisations from that area to make a good decision. Um, so the benefits, so I've gone through a few, but I'll cover a few more. So as I said before, it lets you see the overall picture in real time when you make decisions. So it stops you having to wait until the next grant round to implement any changes. It also gives you more awareness of how decisions are made. So this can again improve the application guidance and organisations can know further in advance whether to put time into the applications. This stops charities um, putting too much time into things that they're never going to succeed in or and it also allows feedback to unsuccessful organisations to know whether to apply again to the next round. It can also ensure a diverse range of applications. So examples of this are black and minoritised led um, organisations. We can um, acknowledge that they're underfunded and therefore set targets of who, we, how many we want to progress in maintaining the percentage because quite often we'll get applications from these organisations and then they'll be automatically filtered out initially because they don't fit the initial criteria. We can also, with the dashboard, assess them separately. So, for instance, if the criteria is always going to be favoured towards large organisations, we can remove that criteria for these organisations to make the process more fair. Um, it also creates a due diligence process for unintentional bias. Um, so as you're going along, you can sort any problems in any subjective criteria there rather than having it influence and sorting it retrospectively. So an example of where we've used this in real life. So in the scoring of applications during a grant round, um, black and minority ethnic led organisations had more variations in their scores. So by variation, we mean if there are five criteria that organisations are scored against, if you have no variation, then your score will remain the same across the board. 
if you have lots of variation, then your score will fluctuate between the criteria. Now, this was a problem in this funding round because each criteria had its own individual threshold to get through to the next round. So if you're an organisation that's got more variation in your scoring, you're much more likely to drop below a threshold on one particular question. This meant a much larger proportion of black and minority ethnic led organisations were being filtered out, despite overall being just as good as the others. So in order to mitigate against this, we used an overall score for these organisations adding them all together rather than individual criteria. And this was a very simple solution that actually meant that we had the correct proportions that we had uh, looked for, so we maintained it so that no one was being filtered out unfairly. And we were able to do this, I would say, in real time during the application process. So these organisations didn't lose out. Another example we had was um, we asked, we scored organisations on different questions in order to rank them for decision making, as is often done in grant funding. Um, now that there were, say there were five questions, there was high correlation between all these questions. So this means that if an organisation scores really highly on one, they'll also score highly on another question. So the first problem with this is all the work this, these funders have done to assess these applications, it, the majority of it's unnecessary. They're assessing five questions when one would have done just fine. So it's already creating more work. This also means that organisations that are historically more underfunded may score a little lower than others, but because there's high correlation, if you score slightly lower on the others, the correlation means you score lower on all of the questions. So it makes the gap much more amplified between the organisations. This then makes a funder looking at the portfolio think that they've got some amazing organisations at the top and some really bad ones at the bottom, when actually that's not the case and one factor could support these organisations to be just as successful. Um, so in summary, using data as part of decision making allows for a more open and fair process and encourages a more equal access to grant funding. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. That's the end. <laughs> Now, I'll come to the room for the first question uh, to Alana in a second. Uh, but for those of you watching us online, a reminder that you can use Slido to put your questions to Alana and to all of our speakers this evening. And if you're not on the Slido already, it's bit.ly slash Slido DB30. Uh, whether you're online or here in the room, if you can, do tell us who you are very quickly and where you're from. Um, we are on the record, of course, um, and please do keep the question. Um, because the timer will start as soon as we start asking the first question. So, who in the room would like to ask the first question of Alana this evening? And do wait for the microphone. Uh, we've got one in the corner there, and then we'll come to you for the next round. Thank you. Hey, um, really good uh, talk, first and foremost. I'm Ollie from Methods Analytics. Um, so, I was just wondering, in terms of embedding the data and the process into what was there before how long did that take and kind of you know from it, there being no data in the decision making process to wherever you are now what was the kind of timeline for that um i think it's still ongoing so as we do it, it's obviously very difficult to implement change when it's been the same for so long so when you cut it's also very daunting, I think, to see a dashboard. That was a very simple example. But if you've never seen data before, to suddenly see a dashboard that feels like it's taking over your data decision making can be quite daunting. So I think it's about slowly introducing it and initially maybe just using it to see how the portfolio looks and then slowly getting into it. It also, from my side, requires time to understand exactly how decisions are made. So I can only see the data, not the nuances. So I think it requires both parts to work together in order to reach a compromise so that the process is different every single time, depending on the fund and depending on the priorities um, as to how it's done. So in conclusion, I don't think it will ever be done. I think it's always improving and it's trying to get the data to reflect how decision make, uh, decisions are made more accurately so that then it can be sort of relayed back to organisations and also made more fair. Excellent, thank you. We've got some questions coming in online, but I will go to the gentleman at the back for the next question. Um, Nigel Dexter from NSNI. Um, there's obviously a big human element in this, so when are you going to start using data for data analysis, i.e. AI, which seems to be flavour of the month? Um, I think in grant making it's always difficult because each fund is, dif is different, and I think from my point of view, particularly in these smaller funds where um, there's a few hundred organisations, 
I think the human element for me will need to be involved for quite a long time. I think AI is really useful for the larger scale and the things, but I think the problem with AI at the moment is you risk missing out these organisations that are chronically underfunded because they don't meet most of the criteria. So you require, I think, the human element to pick that up and then adjust according to each individual situation to maintain all the, the eligibility stuff that you're after. Great, thank you. I'll go online for the next question. This is from Jeremy. Good evening to you, Jeremy. Um, please do you know how the dashboard was implemented? I suppose, how did you build it and uh, what did you do? Um, so initially, SIB um, built it using data just um, to give, I guess, to give an overview of the data and started off there. And then it was, what's the easiest way to change these criteria? And, um, and we played around with it as, um, as a team and tried it out in different funds. And to be honest, the dashboard in every fund looks different. So some people prefer to see data in a different way. So what I always do is we have meetings with the people making decisions before to try and make sure that everyone is happy with how the dashboard looks in a way that they're comfortable using and that they'll understand. Great, thank you. Um, I'll come to the room for the next question. I'm conscious it's not been a particularly diverse set of questions so far, um, but do put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. Um, let's go second row and we'll come to the first row next time around. Hi there. <coughs> Hi, uh, Andy, uh, Andy Banks from the ONS. Um, with regards to your correlation analysis, would you um, think about revising or changing your questionnaire as a result of that? Is that something that you thought about? Yeah, so that would be the hope. So my my main role is to sort of identify these issues and then work with funders or our funders to um, come up with solutions. But that would be, I think, the best solution to the thing. The other option is looking at the assessors and checking that um, the criteria for how they're assessing it is clear. So there's sort of two options there, and it's difficult to establish which one of them is the reason. So it's sort of a bit of trial and error and... Um, things to go forward. Brilliant, thanks. Um, next question is in the front row. Just wait for the microphone. Mark Thompson, University of Exeter. Uh, thanks so much, really enjoyed it. Um, so I guess I've got a different kind of question. I'm absolutely persuaded by your argument that sunlight is the best disinfectant, if you like. So, uh, you know, the need for greater transparency in, in, in grant making, fantastic. But I think you rightly called it out at the beginning as uh, you mentioned the word power and disrupts power, existing power relations. How confident are you um, about widespread take-up of these practices amongst um, uh, grant funders, I suppose? Um, and uh, do you anticipate a sort of you know, entrenched cultural resistance in some quarters to, to that kind of disinfectant? Yeah, I definitely envisage resistance. Um, I think it's very difficult to change how you do things, and especially when data is so um, unfamiliar to so many people that it can feel like the decision's been taken away from them. But I think it is very slowly working with people, and I think once they get the chance to use it and realise that they are actually in control, and it's merely to help them and aid it and make it more open, then I think it's a lot easier to get people on board through that. I think it's very difficult explaining it without using it yourself to feel like it will be useful and not taking over your decision makings. Fantastic, thanks. Um, I'm going to go online for the next question, so do think about them if you're in the room. Um, Anonymous, good evening to you, Anonymous, asks, do you know of other organisations doing something similar? Do you, do you intend on sharing this process to create a gold standard way of doing this? Uh, I think that would be the most ideal option, yeah. We currently already work with um, a couple of other organisations, um, but yeah, we'd be more than happy to work with more. Be great. Excellent. Do get your offers into Alana um, if you're interested. Um, let's come to the room for the next question. Um, I think we've got one there, and then we've got a question. Now I'll come to you next. Hi there, Ross Caron from the House of Lords, but brackets not a lord. Um, in, your, in your presentation, you, you, you listed a number of the sort of the potentials and, and benefits of this this system. I was wondering if you were to to look back, or if you had looked back. At, uh, at what you were funding before introducing the system, if you were to compare the two, what results you had found from that? Any sort of headline findings? Um, I think the biggest headline finding for us as an organisation is improving our funding for black and minority-led organisations. Um, it's now a much bigger priority to ensure that they have fair access to grants and um, using data to help show exactly how we're progressing with that and how each fund um, is able to do that. 
Thanks. And then we've got a question just there. Hey, Jamie from the number 10 data science unit. Um, do you track outcomes for those that have been funded, or this might be something that will only emerge over time? Um, because, you know, a, a question I'd love to understand more is, you know, which of those grant questions um, are more or less predictive of what actually ends up working? Um, we're currently working a lot on different financial measures to measure success of organisations. So once they're funded with grants, do they go on to receive more funding? Do they go on to then progress to loans? Um, and do they perform as a successful organisation? It's very difficult because charities have different priorities. So some charities may not be looking to grow. And it's very difficult to assess such a diverse range of organisations as to what is successful um, in other things. So I think it's some of it is trusting the organisations because they're small charities. That, um, and some of it is yeah coming up with these measures that can at least track the baseline um, success. Great, thank you. I'm going to squeeze in a final quick question if anyone in the room has one. Any final questions in the room? Oh. Have you tried to understand what um, causes the variation in some of your applications or some of the applications you receive? Um, it's difficult to sort of I'm always very cautious about trying to put a cause to a finding with data. Um, there are multiple possible ones. One could be that these organisations are not the typical organisations that um, funders have seen before. So the criteria isn't really written for these organisations. So it's much more difficult to assess where they are. And criteria is often written to be really good or really bad. So all these organisations that fall in the middle, it's potentially a lot more of a grey area. And that's one potential reason. Excellent. Well, Alana, thank you for getting us off to such a brilliant start this evening, especially for stepping in at such short notice. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And our next speaker this evening is Richard. Uh, so we're back in the room and I will give you your clicker. Thank you. Oh, there you are. There we go. Sort out the crockery. Excellent. I uh, hope everyone can hear me all right. So uh, here to talk about data science and AI in government, how it's more accessible than you think. And the great intimidating time has started. So to talk about some of the issues, um, this is just a quick collection of some of the barriers that I come across and that I've spoken to about when we talk about taking on data science and AI within government. Here are the ones I'm going to highlight, which I think are actually more real than the others. So in terms of hardware and software, yes, if you don't have access and capability in terms of the hardware and software you need to do data science, it's a fundamental blocker. But the ones that get talked about a lot more or perceived as issues are things like information governance where people will say, oh, we can't because. And now, I have never worked on a project which has been stopped on legal or ethical grounds with regards to, um, with it, with regards to information governance. I have run into a lot of situations where information governance teams haven't been told that you're undertaking a data science project and are really quite nervous about it because they've never done that themselves. And they need to be brought along for the journey as much as anyone else does. You know, we are all learning to do data science and AI together. It's really important that everyone is involved in that learning. Now, other things that come in that are more important than this, though, are to do with attitudes. So one of the biggest things that I find is that we talk about how as organizations we're not yet ready to do data science. We have to think about sorting out our data first before we can possibly go on. And that's based on this sort of stuff. There's lots and lots of stuff out there which will tell you that you have to do your data foundations, and then you do business intelligence and data science and artificial intelligence, and it's all terribly far away and in the future. And with any received wisdom, there's just enough truth in it to be just a little bit useful and a little bit dangerous and misleading. Because you get things like this, which say AI and ML is real and within your organization. And just before that, you have consistent, measurable results. I look forward to a day when we have consistent, measurable results in any form of life and work. But for that to be something you have to achieve before you can do AI and ML is just you know, wildly impractical. It doesn't mean these things are completely wrong. It just means that they're just a little bit unhelpful in terms of shaping attitudes. So take this one as another example. Again. It's not wrong, but what it does is it places analytical maturity against advantage. You are better if you are further to the right and up there. 
It's something to aspire to. But in reality, in data science, we'll take clean data and go straight to predictive modeling. So what does this diagram talk about? Sometimes we'll even go from raw data and do some predictive modeling. So are we skipping the steps, or is someone not quite telling us all the truth? So thinking non-sequentially about it, thinking about how we break out of that mold. An analogy, always going to be one. Think about it in terms of different racket sports. So BI and data science and AI and all those sorts of things, there are similarities between them. But you don't train a world-class badminton player by getting them to learn tennis first. That doesn't mean the skills aren't transferable. It doesn't mean there aren't parallels or things that you can learn from this. But it's not sequential. It's not one thing then the other. There's things you can learn from being able to do multiple things. So OK, taking that into account, why am I worried about this? Yet another diagram that's often seen in management talks. I'm concerned that at the moment, within government in the UK, we just are a little bit concerned about where we're up to with data science and a little bit concerned about where we're up to with AI. We're sort of in the pragmatist area for, for data science. It's, it's kind of happening. But I think we're kind of in the chasm at the moment with regards to doing anything with AI. We're a bit nervous about it. We're finding it quite hard to get going. There's some real exemplars out there, but it's not widespread. And that's to do with fear. And that's our data has to be perfect. But that's because people are thinking, you know what, let's get started with AI. We're going to do some automatic categorization about people based on personal information, and it's going to be amazing. That's like trying to learn how to steer a boat by starting with an oil tanker. It's about as difficult as you can possibly get, and the practicalities of it exceed anything that anyone in the market can tell you that they genuinely understand. So why are we starting there? So how do we step out of this? What's the sort of focus as far as I'm concerned? Well, use cases. Use cases are the absolute queen of this. Because people will talk about things like hot topics. They'll be like, this is something that's in so-and-so's mind. If it's a hot topic, chances are no one understands it. So why are you trying to solve this with AI? It doesn't make any sense. You want to solve some of your well-understood problems. Don't pick heavily human processes. The whole thing we're working through throughout the world at the moment is about how AI and humans are going to interact together. So heavily human processes are not going to fit well with that type of transformation. Black box solutions. The magic box will fix everything. As humans, we love to say, you know what? We'll do that, and that will fix things. I've never, ever seen anything work like that. But again, I long for the day where that does. We have to be more realistic. We also get sometimes told to put ROIs on things. when. We're experimenting. We're trying to do new things. We're trying to bring people along for the journey. And actually, the biggest thing you can get as value is on the bottom left, which is about the education for everyone involved by doing these projects. And I have this big fear that by not doing enough experimentation, by not trying hard enough to pick these things out and bring everyone along for the journey, we miss out on training people because it's not been done here. And that's a big problem that we're always going to face because if it's not been done here, how do you convince people that it could be done here? How do you say, oh, well, we're different to them? You know, how do you move past that if you're not actually encouraging people? So finally, just to offer some ways forward rather than just some things saying, oh, we should do. There are some th simple things or some approachable use cases out there, things like data quality improvement. So instead to fix your data, use machine learning to help you do that. It's really good. You can, you can encourage the involvement of your data engineering team with your infrastructure team. You've got opportunities there to learn about what the potential limits of your data are whilst learning something new. Computer vision is something which, you know, if you, again, stick to inanimate objects, please. But it's really, really useful for selling up to the highest people in government. Really, really visual, sells really well. If you want to get investment for something and you can do computer vision, fantastic. And it's really, really well understood. Natural language processing, again, really understood, well-matured technology, lots of open and easy things you can do with it, things like dealing with complaints. But concentrate on insight. Don't think about automating solutions or responses. That's where it always falls down. That's what makes it really hard. But you can get an extraordinary amount out of the data that you already have. Predictive an analysis, and a lot of you are going, that's not even like, what are you even talking about? But actually, all you have to do is take something which is done at the moment, put a predictive element on the end of it, 
People who are learning those skills will find that a relatively easy transition. It's data that's well understood. It's a step forward, and it's something new and different for people to learn about. And you don't know what power you might get from it. I think it's some of the best stuff that I've seen where people have taken machine-generated data, something which they use, say, for monitoring how a part goes wrong. And instead, they start to think about how they could use that to see how the part may go wrong in future. Now, infrastructure optimization. Here's an ROI if you want one. You can use plenty of easily accessible algorithms out there to look at your cloud infrastructure estate and think, how can we optimize that? Are there things that we can do? Again, you get your infrastructure team, your data engineering teams involved, everyone upskills collectively without taking on a challenge which is really, at the moment, very, very complex. So I think I've miraculously finished seven seconds early. It's the most intimidating timer in the world. <laughs> Richard, thank you very much indeed. And I think the campaign starts now to retire data is the new oil and instead use either data is the new oil tanker or data is the new badminton. <laughs> um, I'll come to the room second this time around, so do think about your questions uh, for Richard. Um, if you're online, remember if you're not already on the Slido page where you can submit questions, you can go to bit.ly slash Slido DB30. And in fact, we've got a question online first, which is from Jeremy. Um, who I think is referring to one of the um, lines of text you had on the slide, actually. Don't use what you think is your best data. Hmm. Is this because you'll get unrealistically good results and will never get such good results again? <laughs> um, it could be that, um, and that's definitely a potential outcome. Much more realistically, in my experience, I would say you'll discover that your best data isn't as good as you thought it was, or that you hoped it was, and some of the issues that you find in it will not necessarily be preventative in terms of taking the project forward, but people's response to it will be something that you have to overcome. So it's much more about managing people's expectations because someone somewhere will go, but that's our best data. If that's our best data, how can anything ever go right again? So people's emotional engagement with it. Um, in my line of work, we often talk about the five stages of grief with regards to these sorts of messages. And, and it's absolutely classic. You can follow it through wherever you go. Whenever you land a message like that with someone, it shakes their expectations. And that's much more difficult to overcome than whatever inadequacies you find in the data. Excellent, thanks. Um, let's go to the room for the next question. Um, you mentioned um, data quality improvement using machine learning as, as one of your uh, sort of driving use cases. Maybe you could give a couple of examples? Uh, yes, so um, if you use something like unsupervised machine learning, to look um, through uh, data which you expect to take a certain format. So that can be something as simple as, um, let's say, a healthcare record, something like that. Um, there are patterns within that which you look, when you look at the very large data volumes that are available, which become extremely unlikely. And you can start to very, very easily train algorithms which say, look, I don't know if this is wrong, but it's weird. And it's, it's, a, it's a relatively easy way of filtering things which on a human scale are almost impossible to process. So these are the sorts of things that people worry about when taking on AI projects because they go, well, if the data's not right, then it will just continue to be wrong. But actually, if you start to have some processes first where you challenge that using the kind of techniques you're using, then it is much, much easier to do. So, I mean, again, if we talk about machine-generated data, then you've got a sort of classic signal and noise problem whereby you can say, okay, look, this, these readings, you've got, you know, you're getting 300 readings a second, and every 15th one just is wrong. And we can just smooth this out, and we can say, look, based on everything else we know about this, that's just an erroneous reading, or there's a sensor wrong here, or something like that. And that just starts to breed much more confidence and understanding in what you've got. Is that? Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'll go online again for the next question. So this is from Paul W. Good evening to you, Paul. In connection with computer vision, you said, as an aside, with feeling, <laughs> stick to inanimate objects. Why did you say that? Um, because it's an incredibly immature area of discussion, I would say. Um, as much as people who work in the industry uh, and talk about it from an ethics perspective and everything else uh, engage with it very heavily, we really don't know yet, except that we know we don't, broadly speaking, like it, how to respond to computer algorithms assessing, say, our face, our gait, all those sorts of things. We're really not sure about it. So if, as government, we're doing that for very particular reasons, and we have to and there are reasons, that's fine, but understand that it's going to come with every piece of baggage you could possibly imagine. And so if you want to start a pilot, you want to encourage people to get involved in data science and AI within government, don't start there. 
it's, it's really, really tough for people to, to sort of get involved in that. Um, the challenge is very real. The challenge is, is um, frankly, for some people, it's very exciting. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be done there, but it's not a good place to start, realistically, is my, is my contention, at least. Great, thank you. Um, I'll come to the audience in the room next. Uh, we've got a question down here, and I'll come to you next time. Hi, Philippa from the Home Office. I was struck by Alana's comment in the previous presentation about how she personalises dashboards, perhaps because of how people consume data and they consume mm. it differently, which could be quite... I mean, on your maturity steps, we're on the left-hand side, kind of maybe in DeFi dashboards. In your experience, what's the data literacy of senior executives? Um, it's, I mean, it's a really good question, and that's actually a point I want to pick up and I'll kind of loop back to you. Um, we are 20 years away from having the people in the most senior positions in government who have grown up with the grown up with computers in the way that you know everyone probably in this room children or relatives have that's just reality so that means that it's they have um, you know a strong onus on them to learn about these things which they haven't actually been exposed to in the same way um, i would say data sort of understanding about data is quite low um, we also typically if you think about the way politics works it's very rarely science backgrounds that necessarily come through um, into, into politics in quite the same way. Um, that's, that's definitely a factor in understanding data. So I think it really is on everyone to, to upskill themselves and to you know, take as much advice as they can of the things people can share. But one of the difficulties with data science and AI uptake is about that personalization. Because the reason that lots of people grab towards AI as if it will solve things is because they think it can present them with answers and that can skip the step of understanding. And then whenever you skip the step of understanding, you're going to lose an awful lot there. And I think the sort of personalization that I was talking about before is fantastic because that's about user-centered design with regards to data. And everybody needs that. And that doesn't matter whether you're doing something apparently, you know, comparatively simple, but most people's math stops at GCSE. So what's simple? You know, what's simple to people who've never been exposed to that before? And it's, it's, it's really understudied, I would say. Great, thank you. Um, we've got another question just down here. Thanks for the great talk. Um, you mentioned that one of the problems can be getting information governance teams on board, uh, and you said that you really need to sometimes bring them with you because they might not have been exposed to that. Could you give some kind of practical guidance or like what are the actual practical steps to, that you do to get them to come with you? Um, I think it's, it's a really interesting one. I've, I've definitely had some success and I've definitely had some failures in this particular area. Um, the, the biggest thing I would say is, is lead time. Um, senior leadership and senior involvement always helps as well. Um, everyone is always busy. Um, and when someone knocks on your door and says, I've got this really exciting but totally terrifying proposition for you, uh, that's not usually the best way to get people on board. Um, never try and sneak stuff in the back door. Uh, with information governance, I would always say asking for permission is essential. I think that there are, to try and speak the same language, try and understand what their concerns will be. Um, talk about data minimization and practice data minimization. As data scientists, we are horrendously guilty of saying, just give me all of it and I'll do something really clever with it and you'll be amazed. But that's, and that's partly because we're slightly used to a lot of scope, a lot of opportunities to do those sorts of things, but actually that's the complete antithesis of what we need to be talking about to our colleagues in that area. We've got time for a final quick question here in the room. Um, Paul Maltby from Department of Lemon Lear. Um, so you had optimizing hardware, but you didn't have optimizing interventions. I was surprised by it. So when we sort of set up the first data science teams back in government digital service some years back, one of the areas of, that felt like really early promise was the sort of uh, issue where you have 100 inspectors, but a million potential uh, problems, where do you send them first? Yep. Um, and I wondered if you, that was a thing or if it's just under you you had it under one of your other categories? Um, no, it's, it, it's probably not one of the places I was just to start. Um, within regulation, I, I've worked with a couple of organizations that have started in exactly that area, uh, and there is a lot of good that can be done there. But typically, all of the data you require to make an assessment of that nature is, is vast, and it's nearly always very much held in the sort of legacy data estate I was talking about as being a bit of an issue. Um, so undoubtedly that is where there is huge value, whether that's in healthcare, whether that's in social care, it doesn't matter where it is. And it can be done, but it is hard. Um, so it's a question of, let's say, if you're a regulator and that's your business, start there. If you're not, 
it's probably not the best place to really build a, a good platform, would be my suggestion. That brings us to a perfect end, uh, nearly perfectly on time as well. Uh, Richard, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And our next speaker this evening is Andrew. Okay. You see the, slide? so the slides will appear shortly. There we are. Fantastic. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name's uh, Andy Banks, and I'm a lead data scientist at the Data Science Campus in ONS. Uh, today, I want to talk about a project uh, that the campus was involved in, published about a week ago, uh, to look at how the price of the cheapest grocery items uh, have uh, changed in supermarkets over the last year. Um, the background to this is that ONS, I'm sure you're aware, produce a wide range of inflation measures, and our headline inflation measure is the Consumer Prices Index, and this shows uh, how the average prices of um, products change over um, a period, and that's a broad mix of both expensive and cheap products. Uh, and that, on, on that measure, uh, consumer prices have been rising quite uh, 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 sharply since the second half of 2021. Uh, and within that, food and drink prices have really um, risen at the fastest rate uh, in April since uh, June 2021. Um, but some people might choose to uh, uh, buy the cheapest, most value range products, uh, perhaps to try and cut back on their spending as much as possible. And so we wanted to understand how the price of the lowest cost grocery items changed over the last year. Um, and we also wanted to understand um, if, a cheapest, if the cheapest product wasn't available, how much extra someone would have to pay for the next cheapest item to give a sense of how product availability uh, affected um, households' budgets. So um, just onto the data, we collected uh, data using uh, web scraping methods uh, every day, uh, for a year um, for seven uh, key retailers uh, for 30 commonly bought uh, food and drink items. And that amounted to many millions of price quotes uh, and accompanying uh, detailed product information for um, the year. It's worth saying we've been doing that for a, for a lot longer, but this was a, the focus of the analysis. And for each of those seven retailers and 30 items, we searched for uh, the cheapest possible item that someone could buy. Uh, and selected that cheapest price, and that was adjusting for the size of the product. Uh, we then constructed the average cheapest price for each of the 30 items and tracked that over the year to see how it um, changed. Worth saying there are a huge number of limitations with the work that are really important to uh, know. Uh, prices are, were based, because it was web scraped, uh, or based on what was available online, and we know that um, online prices and product availability and product ranges may differ depending on uh, compared to in-store. Uh, in some cases, retailers changed their websites, added and removed product ranges that made collection challenging and added volatility to the results. Uh, because we were looking at the cheapest price only for each retailer and item, we only selected one price per month, and so the results are based on a small number of price quotes. And in terms of substitutions, if a product wasn't available in the period, uh, we substituted this with the nearest uh, comparable item, and there are a lot of different ways you can do that, and it has a substantial effect on the results. So to the results... Uh, for uh, the key takeaway here is that there is a huge uh, range of price movements for uh, the very lowest prices for those uh, products. For 10 items, uh, the lowest cost uh, price increased uh, by more than 10%, and for five of those 10, uh, the price increased by more than 15% over the year. Uh, but for six prices, the prices uh, six items, the prices fell over the year, and some uh, rose by less than uh, the uh, official measure of food and drink inflation, which was 6.7%. We could also see how that changed in cash terms. Uh, so the largest price rise uh, was for beef mince, up 32 pence for 500 grams, and chicken breast, up 28 pence 
or 600 grams. Uh, and we wanted to kind of reflect normal shopping habits here. So we excluded very large uh, bulk uh, and multi-buy ranges um, uh, by looking at the, um, the weight. So we took a band. And we constructed an overall price index from this, uh, looking at 30 items altogether. And the, that rose uh, showed a rise in price of around the same rate as um, the official measure of food and drink inflation. Um, in doing this work, we quickly found that there were a lot of other interesting things that you can potentially do with um, individual price quote data and the product information. Um, so we calculated the difference between the cheapest and the next cheapest price um, for the 30 products. And for over two thirds of those products, the difference in price was at least 20%. Um, and for four items, the difference in price was more than 50%. Um, in looking at the product information and the weights, we did identify some evidence of shrinkflation. Uh, this is where the price stays the same, um, but the product um, decreased in size. And we could also look at nutritional information. Um, and with that, we saw that some of the sugar-free and um, salt, low-salt versions of the products um, in many cases were the same price as um, the standard versions of these products. Um, really, really a huge amount of interesting work that you can do um, with both web scraped and um, individual um, price quote data. I just want to end by giving a quick overview of the overall ONS strategy for measuring uh, prices in the coming years. Uh, we, key message is we want to make better use of alternative data sources, so web scrape data, uh, scanner data, and um, other administrative sources. Um, the most exciting work that we're doing at the moment is working with leading retailers uh, to get access to electronic point of sale data, uh, which is uh, scanner data. Uh, often called scanner data. Um, that gives us a census of prices for the retailer, um, and more importantly, the amount of product that's consumed by the customer, um, which is something that we couldn't factor in with this analysis. And that will improve the granularity uh, and accuracy of the statistics, but will also pose us lots of challenges in the way in which we calculate inflation. Um, the reason for that is because there will always be a need for local collection. Um, to, um, uh, to, to do that alongside um, uh, alternative, uh, using alternative data sources. And the reason that we will still need to collect prices manually is because we uh, would need to understand how prices are changing for the small independent stores. So not just the big retailers that might hold this data and, and can supply it to us. Um, and also um, detailed um, product uh, information that you can get from web scrape data is also really important um, when looking at products that experience a lot of quality change. So uh, if you think about the case of laptops or you think about the case of mobile phones, what you really want to know is how the price of that is changing, but also um, how that reflects a change in quality. Um, and what we would normally do is um, uh, 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 kind of factor in how, how, how quality improves over time for these kind of tech goods. Uh, so, to conclude, there's a huge amount of innovative work that we're planning uh, that allows us to track prices uh, faster, give more insightful um, in, uh, kind of information to uh, policy makers and the public. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Andy. I'll come to the room for the first question in a second, um, but just to remind those of you watching us online, if you're still watching this on YouTube and haven't got access to the Slido, uh, it's bit.ly slash slidodb30, and you can use Slido to put your questions to Andy. So, hands up if we've got questions in the room. We've got one at the front, but let, and then I'll come to the one at the back next, and then over you next. So, down here first. Hi, Andy. Um, Thanks very much for that. It was very insightful. Um, I'm fascinated to know the genesis of the idea to do this because I think it's incredibly innovative and interesting work. So the process by which the idea to do this particular analysis really interests me. Yeah. So of course the, the background, you know, is the is is the uh, the sharp rise in inflation and the and the and the and the, and the, the debate on the on, on 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 cost of living, huge amount of public interest and and information that's demanded on a very quick and, and timely basis on 
yeah, the experiences, not just of, the, of, of, of an average consumer, but for, um, for ind individuals. Uh, and there's so many things that we've tried to do to respond to that. Um, firstly, not everyone's inflation rate is the same. And to reflect that, we introduced a kind of personal inflation calculator, uh, which I really recommend uh, checking out. Um, but there was a real uh, missing, missing element to the evidence base, which is how are these very cheap items changing? And there's kind of two, there's two kind of competing hypotheses. One is, well, these products have low margins, and so, um, so potentially um, could rise in price by more under cost pressure than other products. But there's another hypothesis, which is that these products are potentially ones that people, uh, that retailers might keep a little bit more stable because of um, yeah, uh, competition on those specific products, and potentially to drive footfall and things. So it was the absence of information and knowledge that meant that we needed to go to this more experimental data source. Um, the the, the, um, that's not to say that traditional data can't um, uh, rapidly respond to policy questions. So we've done that a number of times when looking at product availability on the shelves and things like that. But it just so happened that this was the, 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 the right um, uh, data to answer the, the question at the right time. Thanks. And then we've got a question at the back next. Hi, thanks, Andy, for that presentation. Very interesting. I was delighted to hear you were going to take supermarket data at the end because that was the whole way through I was thinking, surely Sainsbury's and Tesco's have got a really good idea about this. And not only that, but they have an idea about what the actual shopping basket is that individuals use. And what thinking is going on within ONS about how you might be able to use, you know, with, with appropriate safeguards, the actual data that, that Sainsbury's and Tesco's do? In fact, maybe even their analysis, you wouldn't need their data. Because I bet they look into this as well. Yeah, so this is where, obviously, the, the, the electronic point of sale or scanner data becomes incredibly important. So this analysis is based on web scrape data, but I do want to make the point that for the, the wider strategy for ONS is, is really to use uh, scanner data um, in the future. So yes, when you, when you go to the shop and you buy, buy something, the, 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 the supermarket will hold a, a database of the amount that's bought, but also the price. And so... Um, we are working with the retailers um, to um, be able to access that data. We've we've done so, we've done so, we've done so already, and so this is this isn't uh, this is work that we're actively doing um, uh, and and exploring how how we how we use and process that data. So obviously many you know many hundreds of millions billions of price quotes, and then you know the the ability to create really timely accurate statistics is. Is, 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 much, is much, much improved. Thanks. Uh, then we've got a question just over there. Thanks, um, Andy. That's a really interesting presentation. It actually sort of picks up on the last couple of uh, points, but was related to that piece about um, point of sale data and to an extent where, obviously, you've been thinking here partly about sort of where people are in, in the income distribution in terms of, of the, the impact. But I was wondering to what extent the work with the point of sale data might also consider location. Um, specific, like obviously the two things that come to mind are always petrol prices and the price of beer. Um, but just generally the fact that like obviously, yeah, you're going to see different inflation rates in different parts of the country. Um, yeah. And it'd be really interesting to sort of see that and map that, I think. So that's been something that's been really strongly desired by the public, you know, at re you know, reg estimates of regional inflation rates. And that is something which is challenging with our traditional methods. Essentially, we have a couple of hundred price collectors go out to 100, 200 locations across the UK, collect 200,000 prices. Um, now, if you're trying to understand regional fluctuations or variations um, in prices, you can't do that with the current approach. It's just not um, granular, granular enough. But you're absolutely right that this, um, alter these alternative data sources would allow you to kind of take more of a granular look, not just within the products, uh, so looking at different types of bread or something, uh, if, uh, but, 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 um, but, um, but looking at different regions and, um, as, as you say, uh, yeah. So, th so there's a lot of potential there in terms of the granularity. 
So we've got about two and a half minutes left. I know there's another question in the room, another one there and another one there. Um, I'm very quickly going to go for two online. These are both from Jeremy. One you may not be able to answer because it's very specific. Um, how did sausages go down in price when meat prices were rising and there's a shortage of abattoirs? Was that a quality change? Uh, but another question from Jeremy, which is how is the data skewed by using the sort of big seven um, supermarkets and what effect do corner stores, garages, etc., have on prices? Yeah. It really, really good. I mean, obviously, when we, we good questions. When we, when we, for the first one, I'll try and be brief. Uh, we have had a, a, an awful lot of a, a real, really, a real in-depth look at all of these products. Uh, so we, we, uh, it, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, there are many different potential factors that could be driving the price. Um, we know that there was. Uh, um, uh, pork supply was kind of particularly um, a, a p particular kind of uh, story story there um, in, in recent in recent times. But um, in terms of the second question, obviously, this is um, we were very clear with the analysis that this was limited to those seven retailers. Um, we have tried to um, weight the responses accordingly based on based on the re based on the retailers, um, but yeah, it's certainly possible that different shop types, um, independent stores, um, uh, 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 and such would would be affected. So, but also noting the the um, the online element as well. That's really really important. So these weren't in store prices; these were just just online. Thanks. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, um, I know we're not supposed to call it a windfall tax, but I can't remember what we are supposed to call it. Um, so just in terms of factoring the wholesale side of this, if we do have a you know cost of living crisis and more, there's a shift towards lower price goods, do you have any plans to do any similar analysis at the wholesale level to track that, you know, the kind of profitability of these items going forward? It's a good question. I mean, on, on the wholesale side, we do collect... Um, prices that they're called producer prices, um, both kind of producer input and output prices. So we look at the prices that come into the factory gate, so raw materials, um, obviously, you know, oil, big fat, and, and, and other materials like that, big factor, um, but then also how that comes out of the factory gate. That's for kind of manu man manufacturers. So I think there's a lot of interest in understanding, um, in understanding margins. Understanding margins is incredibly challenging um, because you've got so many different factors and labor and capital is also important to understand the dynamics of that when you're thinking about mar margins. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's a good point. But th there are some data that we can, we, can, we, can, we can look at to try and associate input costs with input, input prices and output prices. I think we could probably go on for another eight minutes. Sorry to those of you in the room and those online whose questions I didn't get to. Um, but Andy, thank you very much indeed. And uh, for those of you who didn't get to ask a question in the room, um, if you want to ask the questions first next time, uh, I'll come to you first. So, uh, Mark. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Mark Thompson, um, and I'm from Exeter University. I was, I should say, for about 25 years, a director of Methods. Um, I recently retired from Methods, so I'm now enjoying being a full-time academic. Um, and I'm not a data scientist, so you all think, what the heck am I doing here? Maybe let's see in eight minutes' time, I think. Um, I work in a business school, so I'm going to try and bring a business school perspective to basically share a few opinions and ask a few questions about government, digital, and data. So uh, off we go. Let's see if I can. Um... Okay. So my first my first opinion, if you like, is from a business school perspective. We need to we need to catch up in government. There's lots and lots to talk about. You know, disruptive emerging technologies, and, and look at all these sectors, and all, of course we've we've had this data in the oil business and all this hype, particularly in the private sector. Public sector, I think there's much, much less in the literature. There's much less attention out there to what's happening in government's use of data. Um, increasingly, of course, it's speeding up. We all know about Moore's Law. The amount of data you can get on a chip uh, doubles every 18 months. When I was at university, you could hold, buy a whole 10 meg of uh, storage for 3,398 bucks. And now, of course, um, uh, if you're a very good customer, Amazon will rock up with this, uh, with this truck, which holds, uh, what does it say here? Uh, 100 petabytes of data. And that, that picture is about three years old. So it's speeding up. So basically, the challenge to us to catch up is really, really speeding up. And I accept, though, that we, we've got to learn to kind of walk before, you know, before we run. We have to be probably defensive. This is a paper I quite like about what's your data strategy. It's a very high-level piece for executives. But basically, distinguishes between offensive and defensive strategies. If you're a fast-moving consumer goods company, you probably need to be offensive. You need to move fast and break things, to quote somebody. 
Um, if you're government, you're more likely to be on the defensive top. If you're a hospital, for example, um, to the side of that spectrum. So I accept that. Except we've got to be defensive uh, and, that, and we've got to get the basics right, right? So these are some of the things I've spent a lot of time talking about and talking about the students. And of course, we need taxonomy, we need governance, we need ethical frameworks, we need, you know, we need to rank our business opportunities to use data. And these are some of the things I think we're probably used to, used to hearing about. So we need to get the basics right. Second thing I think we need to do is to speed up our willingness to innovate. So some more unstructured data picking up on uh, the previous uh, conversation. Uh, so one thing I particularly like is a use case about uh, a couple of uh, entrepreneurs in New York. They were traders. Um, and basically, one of them noticed that a bunch of unstructured data from satellite data uh, of, of the world's oceans, it's pretty much free, and it tracks when these, when these big boats, these, these containers are moving uh, heavily laden, it leaves a trail in the water, a wake which is visible from space, and they're highly, when they're lightly laden, uh, this trail disappears. So they used, obviously, scraped all this data, bungs it through machine learning, and they can start to predict real-time GDP trading levels before the rest of the market. Using junk, right, data exhaust nobody else wants. How can we start to think that way a little bit more in government? Can I use a mouse here? To, yeah, so... This is something we did at Methods. In fact, Richard and Ollie here uh, were, were involved in this. So again, using some of the innovation, I believe, comes from using some of the heavy lifting in cloud. This isn't actually running properly because it's supposed to be identifying potholes, and you, you can, it's happening too quickly. Anyway, you can see uh, what we did here was actually strap some very cheap cameras to bin lorries for Swindon Councils, won an award, Digital Leaders Award, continuously uploading data about where potholes are, bunging it through machine learning and identifying kind of prioritized uh, uh, you know, repair schedules. We did the same thing with, um, with fly tipping. Okay, so disaggregating horrible bunches of fly tipping into different types of rubbish which should be collected automatically by different contractors. So that's using cloud technology um, to, 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 if you like, do the heavy lifting on the data to be innovative. Something a colleague told me the other day, I'm pretty sure it's Newnham, I'm pretty sure it's Newnham. Fascinating example of a London council who had a sink estate that went wrong very, very quickly. Lots of things went wrong together on the law and order side of things. Um, they profiled that. What were the key indicators to describe that? They've trained um, machine learning bots, and now actually they're performing that kind of analysis across their entire um, estates. Uh, to identify and spot some of those lead indicators very, very quickly. I know so there's some similar kind of ideas being done in healthcare at the moment. That's fascinating. So using cloud and emerging tech to do the heavy lifting on the data. Having done more innovation, I think we can start to actually generate citizen data scientists, which I think is interesting to hold government to account, which is why I asked the question about the kind of... Um, you know, sunshine being the best disinfectant a bit earlier. I'm, I'm very keen on that. So I was playing around with some ideas with a colleague, Jerry Fishenden, the other day, um, and hence the, uh, the, the, we're kind of playing with these ideas, so hence the kind of uh, the, the folksy language here. But transparency, right? Why shouldn't um, Paul, <laughs> why shouldn't, um, you know, uh, uh, housing uh, or, and or local authorities be mandated to expose um, their performance a, a lot more in very, very citizen-readable and kind of usable uh, formats. You know, why shouldn't maybe unions start to give their members direct access to data about where, for example, job opportunities are, therefore maybe disintermediating some of these platforms like Uber, right? So why shouldn't that happen? Why shouldn't, topically enough, we provide people with much, much more direct access to data about uh, energy? Uh, maybe thinking about, again, disintermediating people who are not necessarily adding value, but who hoard that data to their own commercial advantage. There's some really exciting opportunities, I think, to not just to innovate, but to actually uh, make some of the incumbent private and public sector organizations a little bit more accountable. I think on that note, uh, this is something that, that kind of caught my eye the other day. I thought I, I liked the sound of it. It's two or three years old now. A model from the ODI. Data institutions. So, again, you can see this. I wouldn't make too much of this diagram, but... Again, you've got the kind of traditional fears, if you like, data hoarding for corporates on one side, data fearing citizens on the other, maybe, corporates by, by which I include government. But this idea, maybe, of government is thinking about themselves as data institutions, opening up data for a wide diaspora, wide ecosystem, if you like, of innovation. So empowering people, facilitating safe access, publishing it openly. Um, I think that's a great... That's a great kind of mandate and, and set of aims, if you like, to guide a lot of government policy, and we could go into that maybe a bit later. Has echoes for me of, of course, O'Reilly's government as a platform idea, but maybe now we're starting to talk about government as a data platform. What does that mean? The kernel of the idea is government doesn't do all the innovation itself. It opens itself up to a vast ecosystem of people who can do it. Um, enjoy getting involved in this. So this is and talk about accountability. A quick example, I scraped this off GovUK the other day. It was actually a methods project with the Cabinet Office, I believe, um, Ethnicity Facts and Figures. So uh, started publishing data again to hold government to account. 
This is an example I just drilled into about people who are identify the government category Black Caribbean, um, and they're you know, a bunch of very, very usable data. If you're like me, I'm not a data scientist, I don't like pivot tables and spreadsheets, you've got to make it nice and easy and intuitive to see what's going on here. So, for example, we can see that people in this category get a pretty raw deal in the UK when it comes to education, and we can hold DFE to account. Here, this is law and order, and this is stop and search, for example. These things are on GovUK's websites, and they're tremendously empowering. Finally, I think, once we start to do that, maybe citizens can start to gain a bit more agency over their own futures. I kind of, I'm keeping an eye on this. I think this is a great initiative. So I think it's going for its second round of funding. It's a social enterprise called Equal Care. And here, the idea is that a lot of people who need care feel very, very disempowered on the, on the, on the citizen side. And on the carer side, a lot of people feel underpaid. Um, they're, they're working in the informal economy. And they have very little control over uh, their, their working arrangements. <clears throat> so, this is a platform, obviously. Uh, you can see on the one side, uh, people who want to find support, and on the other side, people who want to give support. Uh, the carers are paid properly because it, it's disintermediated. Uh, frankly, I think probably a lot of the state institutions here, uh, subject, of course, to the right governments and regulation. And on the left-hand side, uh, people can construct their own care teams that might include family members, and they get to interview and have some say in who it is who actually looks after them. I think that's fascinating. They've been trialing in Yorkshire, uh, and I think they're about to start opening in London. And by the way, I'm not on the payroll. I've never spoken to them. Uh, but I think it's a very interesting harbinger of how we might go, where we might go in the future. So in summary, I think we need to catch up. It's not all our fault, because uh, most people concentrate on the private sector stuff. We need to innovate. We need to empower citizen data scientists, and maybe, in turn, listen when those newly empowered citizens start to actually ask questions about what we're here to do in government. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much. Um, again, I will come to the room first for questions, and if you wanted to ask a question last time but couldn't, I'll come to you first. If you're watching us online, use the Slido. If you're not already on the Slido, which you really should be by now, it's bit.ly slash Slido DB30. So, who in the room would like to ask a first question of Mark? Uh, the point about data institutions, um, I think quite fascinating, actually. There's a lot of talk about it, and um, there are some initiatives across government and the DW people talking about data trusts and so forth, which is effectively curating the data for, for, for use and, and, and being responsible to a degree with its quality. Who should do that? Is it, is, is, it, is it the private sector? Is it government? Is it universities? What's your thought of that? So, um, again, I'm not setting myself up as a, a data scientist or a kind of expert in this. However, um, I'm, I'm particularly animated by Thinking, for example, about Department of Health. So Department of Health, you know, most of the Department of Health budget is, of course, rightfully at the moment, focused on, um, on sickness and on cures and on hospitals and beds and, and what happens when things go wrong. Obviously, we're all aware in this room of the phenomenal exploding data industry in wellness about keeping people actually, uh, you know, uh, well in the first place and preventing them from getting sick, um, which I guess in public sector parlance is is avoiding failure demand, or is it demand failure? I can never remember which way the two, the two words go around. But, um, so for example, you know, what are we doing at the moment as a central part of our health strategy? What is government doing at the moment to start thinking about curating this enormous pool of data? Uh, because I think, you know, as I understand, uh, big pharma, big tech, all sorts of private sector organizations, very cashed up, are coming after this data. Um, personally, this is where politics, I guess, comes in, I would personally, like to see that data belonging to the polity, and belonging to citizens for our own benefit and licensed out to, again, an ecosystem, an active ecosystem of innovation and investment around that. But um, I'm sure there's some thinking going, going on in DOH, but it's, I don't think it's particularly public uh, that I'm aware of. And it would be great to see that because I think that it's going to, uh, you know, I think the, the, the pressure to come up with a strategy about, uh, and, and that's just one example in health, right? I think it's going to grow and grow and grow. So I'd, I'd like to see government, if you like, um, curating that, but, but not just curating it in terms of sitting on it, but actually actively going out there and building the ecosystem of people who are going to do stuff with it and enabling that to happen. Thank you. Uh, any other questions in the room? Yes, we've got one there. Ben Hawes. Um, I, I wondered, I'm following on from that point. I mean, public bodies have important, as you say, defensive uh, duties to protect data. 
they don't, by and large, have duties to realise public benefit from data. I mean, do you think, do you think maybe actually we should start looking at duties and responsibilities and, and sort of actually, you know, it's difficult to fund everything in the public sector if it's not in your duties and responsibilities or you can't draw a direct line to it. You know, perhaps uh, it, it should, should perhaps public bodies be, be given you know, a bit more help getting there? So I think it's a great question. And for me, it resonates very strongly with what was a very trendy topic about a year ago, which is public value. And I think our, we have a very 20th century notion of public value and ways of measuring public value. And, and, um, and I would challenge that in two ways, really. One is that the digital era means that a whole bunch of things that used to be largely transactional activities that used to be publicly valuable things to do in departments are, are actually a tragic waste of time and I reckon consume between 25 and 30 percent of the entire budget for most departments. So that's no longer publicly valuable activity and that's obviously very difficult conversations to have within those departments. And the second way in which I think public value is old fashioned is, is I think you just hit on. So once you start to digitize a lot of those back end transactions, you start to have data and, and therefore there is tremendous opportunity cost in, in just ignoring that. Um, so I guess uh, across a lot of government, I think a lot of our, our, our use of data uh, belongs to data science specialists and that's great and we're, I mean you know, we're, we're doing some fantastic work I would love to see you know when we when we start to really think about digitizing government um, and in terms of in particular getting emerging tech and cloud-based utilities and services crawling over standardized transactional back ends you start to generate extraordinary quantities of, of very very useful data and insight on the back of that and all of that that's lost so uh, so I think there's a lot of public conversations about public value that just completely ignore um, you know, digitization and then, of course, the fantastic data insights that you can then start to generate and innovation. Thanks. Any more questions in the room? Thanks. I feel like I should uh, give it a go. So it's Paul from uh, Department for Leveling Up, uh, given that I was invoked. Um, so, so the thing around, um, uh, you know, government as a platform, government as a data platform just feels tremendously important to me, but perhaps doesn't have that broader traction across uh, public services and in the, in the wider debate. It's something within Department for Leveling Up we are doing on planning reform. So uh, indeed, we've been here talking about that uh, before. Um, and in the Leveling Up and Regeneration Bill, there's clauses that say actually government will set uh, standards for local government around the way in which uh, planning data is is published and uh, uh, standardised, which is quite an interesting uh, part of that. My reflection on it, though, is that that's it's really easy to say, but it, there's another side of it, which is the um, the software side within the local government uh, market and within you know, from the suppliers and within. Uh, local government itself. So you need those sort of both parts to work because you, you can declare the standards, but if actually no one knows how to do it and the, the technology doesn't allow it, that's only one part of the story. So I think it's really valuable, but it's quite involved, I suppose. It's, it's more of a comment, sorry, sorry, than a question. Do you agree? <laughs> so, this is what I absolutely agree. In fact, it pretty much goes to my previous response. In other words, I think the two go together. A lot of data innovation we can expect in government comes once we start to standardise around common platforms, particularly around a lot of the transactional stuff, especially in local services. So, so absolutely right, the two, to a degree, go together. Thanks. We've got another question just here. Thanks. Um, interested to hear how you think um, the, this kind of data and information for the public is, is it should be best uh, accessible to them. It's best, best, it should be made best accessible to them. So, is it through a, uh, a central uh, sort of kind of source of information? Isn't it? Is it? Is it not also the case that that uh, a citizen user would typically consume information and data through, you know, the media and other 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 kind of outlets as well? So, what, how do you kind of see? Uh, yeah. Where do you see the improvement coming? What an excellent question. Do you know what? I haven't really thought about it. I think it's the honest answer. Um, so, so I absolutely, you know, uh, we, there, there, there'll be a role forever for, for organisations, I'm sure, like the ONS, and there's a lot of data that, that I think people need to, to you know, to, 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 to have a kind of canonical interpretation of. Um, so there's that. I'm sure there will be more market for kind of GitHub style, style you know, CSV files and kind of have a go stuff. Um, but I think that's terrific as well. Um, but obviously those things are subject to spin. And uh, so, so I guess... For me, my immediate reaction to what you said is, is you know, 
a lot of this is public data. There has to be some sort of canonical set and interpretation of that, and therefore there are some governance and some, some organizations who will do that. Um, but notwithstanding that, I do think it's, it's, it's maybe important to explore avenues for exposing some of, the, some of this data and this raw data. But in particular, you know, I guess the, the, um, the ethnicity facts and figures example I put up there is, is, is something in, in halfway, isn't it? Because it's curated, um, it's made very accessible, but you're allowed, you're allowed to draw your own conclusions about it and ask questions about it. So yeah, I don't know, but yeah, it's a really interesting point to think about. Unless anybody wants to ask a question in about two to five seconds, um, we might leave it there. So, Mark, thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. So all that stands between you in the room and some free drinks, um, and those of you watching us online with whatever you want to get on with, um, just a few quick parish notices. Um, keep an eye on the Institute for Government website for the latest, for analysis of the latest political developments. Goodness knows what they're going to be. Um, whether it's more around standards, confidence votes, or reshuffles, the IFG will be on it. Uh, the next data bites will be taking place on the 6th of July, and then we have that special bonus one on the 20th of July, so please do come and join us for that. And there are also lots of other IFG events coming up on electric vehicles, reinvigorating UK democracy, probation, procurement, the role of the Lord Chancellor, and in conversation events with Andy Burnham and some Tory backbencher called Jeremy Hunt. So all that remains for me to say are some very big thank yous. First of all, thank you to all of you for joining us, whether you're here in the room or online. Um, some brilliant questions tonight as well. Of course, two methods analytics uh, for supporting tonight's event. And as I said, it's only thanks to our sponsors that we're able to keep the series going. So a huge thank you to them. And finally, join me in a, an actual and virtual round of applause for our fantastic speakers this evening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.